Okay, good afternoon. My name is Dan McKiernan from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm the board chair, and we're opening the TATOG management board meeting today on August 7th. Um, first order of business is the approval of the agenda. Is any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I'll consider it adopted by consent. Um, next is the approval of the proceedings from the last meeting, which was um, almost a year ago, October 2018. Are there any recommended or suggested changes to the proceedings? Seeing none, consider it adopted by consent. Next is under public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak uh, on any of the items that is not on today's agenda? I don't believe anybody has signed up. Uh, according to Kirby, all right, very good. All right, the, uh, we just have a few issues today, so I'm sure we can get through this uh, and keep on schedule. The, uh, the major business today is uh, developing or adopting uh, implementation guidelines for this commercial harvest tagging program, which is a component of Amendment 1 um, requiring a commercial harvest tagging program for TATOG. Uh, it was originally intended to be adopted in the year 2019. Um, the board has postponed that to 2020. And um, at our uh, previous meeting, we shared these guidelines. Uh, it's been distributed to you all with um, uh, your, looking for your input. And so today what we want to do is uh, approve those uh, and decide uh, you know, what, what level of, of, um, of compliance these, these rules or these guidelines are actually going to uh, constitute for purposes of complying with this plan. I know that uh, Kirby has a presentation um, to give us. Uh, in, ad in addition, the board, the TC, and the advisory panel have all weighed in on that, and Kirby's going to give us a presentation on some of that today. So uh, without any uh, delay, we can turn it over to Kirby for the presentation. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to go through the draft of implementation guidelines for the Tatal Commercial Harvest Tagging Program. Just a brief outline, give you all some background regarding this, the tagging program requirements that are stated in the amendment, a one. Uh, then go through the draft implementation guidelines that were put together, what the implementation timeline will be, as well as the technical committee's review, the advisory panel's review and feedback, and then for this board to consider management action. So I want to just put it first on your, on your guys' radar really when we're talking about these implementation guidelines. The board today has kind of three courses of action they could take. The first is to specify changes to these implementation guidelines, these draft implementation guidelines. The second would be to, to adopt these uh, guidelines as best management practices for this harvest tagging program. So. In doing so, they wouldn't be requirements, but they would be the best management practices, practices to carry out this tagging program uh, in its first few years. The third uh, course of action could be instead to consider specifying aspects of these implementation guidelines as actual FMP compliance requirements. So that would be taking some of those uh, pieces that are included in the document and making them uh, an actual an addendum to the FMP and requiring states to comply with them annually. So I just want to put that on your radar now. We'll revisit this at the end of the presentation. So first, the tagging program requirements as outlined in Amendment 1. So the commercial harvest tagging program was required to combat illegal and unreported harvest of Tatog. Specifically, the requirements as described in the amendment include uniform single-use tags with unique identifiers to be applied to TATOG by the harvester before offloading, and that the number of tags allocated to harvesters to be determined by the state based on a biological metric, that unused tags be returned to the state management agency no later than February 15th of the following year, and that each state must submit an annual commercial tag report as part of annual compliance reports, including information on tags used and issued, participating harvesters, and reported commercial harvest. 
So as you all are aware, this program was supposed to go into effect this year in 2019. By board action, it was postponed until January 2020. Now, shifting from what the requirements that are in the FMP to the draft implementation guidelines, uh, staff worked with the board chair, the LEC, and TC to develop these guidelines. And again, the goal here was to provide guidance on how this program should be administered, encourage consistency between state programs, and try to enhance enforcement. It also recommended procedures for tag distribution, application, accounting, reporting, tag expiration, penalties, and outreach to help facilitate this program. So the first section of the draft guidelines provides recommendations on tag distribution. So in year one, what would happen is that ASMSC would purchase the tags on behalf of the states. States are then responsible for distributing those tags to licensed and permitted harvesters. To avoid confusion and reduce the opportunities for unauthorized individuals to obtain the tags, this is how we are going to address this through the commission purchasing them and then these tags being sent to the states. The LEC and TC agreed that accounting and reporting would be made easier if harvesters were issued tags with consecutive numbers. The states would need to determine the total number of tags to, to order and the number to uh, uh, allocate to each harvester based on a biological metric like the prior year's harvest and numbers of fish plus an additional amount as a buffer. Tags should not be transferable and regulation should prohibit reuse, altering, or counterfeiting of tags. Regarding tag application, the LEC recommended adding language to the amendment requirements to specify that all fish need to be tagged prior to offloading or before carring to ensure that there aren't any untagged to tog remaining on vessels without an authorized harvester on board. It is also recommended that the tags be applied consistently to the operculum of the fish on, a, on one side of it. The TC had indicated the tags could be applied to either side of the fish and not interfere with any biological sampling. Again, application of tags in se sequential order would simplify accounting and reporting, though we understand that this might be challenging if certain tags are lost or damaged um, in the first year. Tags need to remain on fish until final sale. That's another recommendation that was put forward and there's the need to restrict tag applications during closures in the fishery. Please note that it would be ideal for harvesters, as I said, to apply the tags in sequential order, but we understand that this might not be possible. So this is an example of how the tag would be applied to uh, a fish. Note it might be difficult to apply tags to the left side of the fish if, for example, a person is left-handed. So you can see it's applied to the left operculum. The draft guidelines outline that states need to allocate tags based on this biological metric. Uh, a biological metric is, is an estimate to determine the number of tags that would, would be required per year and the types of metrics included would, with what some states calculate as part of their striped bass tagging program. So for example, taking the average commercial weight per fish from the previous year and using that as a basis to develop a number of fish and in turn a number of tags that are needed. So this language that's up on the screen now is what we would be looking for for the states to submit as part of their biological metric request. In terms of accounting and expiration, the amendment requires that unused tags be returned by the harvester to the state agencies that issue them no later than February 15th of the following year and the LEC recommended adding or within 90 days of the end of the fishing season, whichever is sooner, to reduce the gap between the end of an early season and tag returns. In terms of these draft guidelines, it's also recommended that harvesters should document, document tags that are lost or broken and that annual uh, commercial tag reports would include all of this information. The other potential recommendation that was included was the tags expire at the end of the fishing year. Please note that currently there is not language in the amendment on when tags expire. 
In terms of penalties and outreach, this would be left up to the states, but some ideas that were put forward in the document is that states should determine appropriate penalties, including suspension or, or um, removal of the commercial license or permit, wholesale dealer permit, retail dealer permit, or authorization to purchase the TOG, as well as confiscation of all TOG caught and possessed or sold in violation, seizure and forfeiture of all property used in violation and fines, and then an outreach program to raise awareness of how the, the tag should be applied correctly would, would go a long way in ensuring that the program works successfully. So in terms of a tentative timetable moving forward today, the board would consider these draft implementation guidelines. Following this meeting, states will need to submit their, their tag allowance or their biological metric to staff likely at the end of August or early September. And as I said before, ASMFC would order these tags and the tags would be sent to the states. Once that purchase has happened and the, and the uh, tags are sent to the states, the states will then be responsible for distributing those tags to harvesters. And again, the goal would be to have those tags distributed to harvesters such that effective January 1, fish could start being tagged in 2020. Just so that it's clear, these tags would be sent from the manufacturer to state agencies. It wouldn't be going to ASMFC and then sold, and then sent to uh, the, the states. Uh, next for the TC summary, uh, the, the technical committee talked through a number of these uh, elements of the draft implementation guidelines and uh, had the following uh, comments. So in terms of where to apply the tags on the fish, as I mentioned before, tags could be applied to either a perculum. This is because they can uh, collect biological samples from either side of the fish. In terms of the biological metric, uh, there was a, a discussion on the tag loss. So we've had a number of states that have actually gone through and tried implementing these or you know, through a trial period. And what we found is that there is approximately about a 10% loss rate. And what that means is that they've, they've got their order, they go out on the water, and they try applying them. And at, at least 10% of the tags that they were trying to apply either broke or came off. And so that should be factored into any uh, amount of tags that are being requested by the states. The TC also recommended that after the first year, there should be an evaluation of the appropriate tag loss rate, such that if, if there's a general understanding that 10% works, that if you're finding that there's a loss rate in certain parts of the coast or in certain states that is much higher than that, then that might start to become a, an area of concern. In terms of expiration dates for tags, there was no consensus on the concept of a tag expiration date. And there was a need to clarify whether there would be an expiration date of the tag versus the expiration date of the sale of the fish. In terms of potential times of year in which uh, tags could expire, uh, the technical committee noted that possibly the end of February might be a, a potential time frame. Next, the advisory panel reviewed these draft guidelines as well and had the following uh, comments. They raised a number of concerns. Uh, regarding tag application, accounting and distribution, ac expiration, and penalties, and I'm just going to summarize a few of them. These materials were included in um, an email sent to you all last week. So in terms of the tag application, uh, there was concerns raised that there may be a higher mortality rate than what was concluded in the New York study that has been the basis for us uh, identifying the tag to be used in the upcoming year. Uh, concerns focused on that study had a controlled environment with those uh, animals being able to be tagged and kept in uh, a condition that allowed them to have a higher survival rate than might happen in, in other situations uh, that aren't controlled for uh, a number of variables. Additionally, and to that point, applying tags while fishermen are on the water uh, may be difficult. In terms of tag accounting and distribution, uh, there was a recommendation to possibly move forward with a partial allocation of tags annually. 
So it would be conditional on getting the other part of the tags that the harvester would be allocated based on them returning their unused tags annually. In terms of tag expiration, uh, the AP noted that there is a significant market demand for Tatog around Chinese New Year, which varies year to year between late January and February. Um, and this would complement or complicate, excuse me, tag expiration dates if they followed along a calendar year because a number of fish tend to be caught in December and then held for a certain amount of time in preparation for that uh, market. It was also noted by at least one AP member that there wouldn't be the need for an expiration date um, if the tags were to be uh, applied and there was a, a calendar year deadline that by December 31st annually the fishing year ended. Last, there was the note that penalties need to address more than simply commercial harvesters that are not uh, operating properly within the harvesting program, the tag harvesting program. That uh, there are recreational harvesters who are catching to talk and then selling to dealers without a valid commercial license uh, or permit and that addressing those loopholes need to be done. So again, those were comments from the AP. We also received um, some requested changes um, from the state of Maryland. Uh, as you all are aware, staff sent out these draft guidelines uh, to the board in early June. Uh, we received comments from Maryland regarding re uh, requested changes. I'm going to walk through those briefly now. Uh, so they, they boil down to three items. The first was to allow some states to delay implementation until July 1st. Uh, this would effectively be postponing uh, the implementation date for the tagging program and would require board action. In terms of the, their second concern, they are requesting that there be an allowance of conservation equivalency for states to allow dealers to tag uh, the fish rather than harvesters. Um, I believe this would also require an addendum to the FMP to allow for this. In terms of tag expiration, uh, Maryland also noted uh, a concern to allow dealers to retain inventory into the new year. It's not a current FMP requirement, as I mentioned before, in terms of there being an expiration date. And so if this board wished to specify an expiration date on these tags, that would also require an addendum. So to summarize, in terms of board actions today, this board could specify changes to these implementation guidelines board can adopt these guidelines as best management practices and not make them requirements for the harvest tagging program, or this board could consider certain parts of the implementation guidelines and make them compliance requirements, and this would likely require an addendum. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, ASMC is going to buy the tags for the state. Is there going to be one large order? <laughs> okay. Is there going to be one large purchase? Uh, would we be allowed to purchase tags mid-year if the need arose, or should we just estimate now what we really think we're going to need? So I'll take a first stab at this and Tony might have a follow-up. So the plan is to have a bulk purchase for this first year. Um, there has been some discussion about whether mid-year there's the ability for states to do an additional purchase of tags, depending on how it plays out in the first few months. Uh, but there hasn't been any determination on how that would play out in 2020 at this point. So aside from the bulk purchase of the tags, um, that, that's about where we stand, but Tony might have some more information. First, I want to clarify that we are going to purchase these tags, but the states are also going to reimburse us back. We are not actually buying them for you. We're physically doing that, but not paying for them. Um, second, in Lobster, we in, for, the, for trap tags, we've been able to negotiate a price, and then that price can last. Uh, throughout the course of the time of that contract that we have with the company. 
Um, when I believe when Caitlin spoke with the, the tag company, we get the, the lower price in the tags because of the volume that we're purchasing them in at that given time. Uh, I don't know if that price would then also carry over if we're not buying at the same bulk, but we can talk with the company and see if we can get that to work. If not, I'm sure that the states could order additional tags later on. It just might be at a higher rate per tag. Michael Weesey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a question comes to mind now. Mar we made some comments. Maryland doesn't have a commercial tog fishery. Our fishermen operate under the recreational limits of two fish in the summer and maybe four fish in the winter. It's almost a year-round season. It's a bycatch to sea bass fishing and, and some lobster fishing. Um, but my question has to do with how the current commercial fisheries up and down our coast operator, and I'm looking across the table, are they mostly derby style with limited access permits? Is that how, is that how fishermen are, are you know, everyone has a quota and not everybody has a quota? I'm just wondering, I, I don't know much about the commercial talk fishery, but I'm thinking about an experience that I went through that almost put me in the grave when I had to use biological metrics in the striped bass fishery. And when I got that big giant box of tags, I had to decide of my 1,200 uh, permitted fishermen how I was going to give those tags to them, knowing that I couldn't order any more. And that became the ITQ issue that, again, almost put me down. That was, that was not fun at all. Um, so I'm only just bringing this up. If you have a derby-style fishery with a lot of fishermen participating, and you only have a limited availability of tags, everyone's going to tell you that they're going to catch as much as they can this year, and you're going to have to figure out a way to allocate those tags. We did it through an ITQ on harvest history, but I don't, I don't know if this is all going to lead to something like that, which you know we may want to think about if that's something that you want to take on as a state. Mike, do you want an answer to the question, or was that a rhetorical question about the states? I mean, all right. Well, Kirby, do you want to just give a summary of what the state's rules are? Uh, I can give you a general one and then get into more details if you want, but basically there are some states that have a commercial quota, you know, as part of Amendment 1, and then there are other states that do not have a commercial quota. Um, and then each of the states have different requirements for what their, their permitting and licensing is for their commercial fishery. Jay McNamee, next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to the, the root um, question that you asked, Kirby, you know, I, I like some of the things that are in the guidelines. Um, I, I like all of them. Some of them I think would be problematic to try and dictate. So for instance, I like the expiration date. I think the penalty stuff would be really difficult. Uh, states have very different mechanisms for that sort of thing. And so um, I'm hesitant to you know, ask to initiate an addendum. I, I think the, the most, um, I don't know, sensible thing that we could do is let this shake out for a year and revisit it like this time or, or you know at the annual meeting next year let the states test it out and then revisit these guidelines and say we should really implement x y and z in an addendum because my sense is we could give you a couple of things you'd go out to rulemaking and we'd have to do it again next year anyways um, so that's just a suggestion for me thank you rob o'reilly yeah, I, I agree with Jay. Um, I don't know how we do that exactly, but um, certainly this, this has caused a lot of consternation in Virginia on how to do this because I wouldn't say we have a derby fishery, but we have sort of an erratic pool of commercial fishermen, um, and we think we can use the metric to help with that. We'd have to put something in a regulation that said if you don't have a tag, then you're in violation. Um, I, I guess that's how we go forward there. I was interested in the violations as well. You know, we have a 
matrix of guidelines for penalties that started in 2013. And so I hope that that was just sort of a suggestion that Kirby put up there that what states could do because for give you an example, um, if there was a violation in Virginia, then the most you could expect as a harvester would be a six month revocation. That's the most in that fishery. So uh, it would take a couple of revocation, a couple of violations to get you to go beyond that for you know up to five years. So I mean, we have a fairly good working situation and I'm just taking those as recommendations. Um, I wasn't positive in the beginning, Kirby, if I may, on the best management practices versus having something that would be compliance. But if we're thinking of best management practices, then what Jay McNamee suggested, I would seem we do need a trial for this. Um, you know, a lot of us already are swamped, and uh, I can tell by the way the reactions that I received uh, at BMRC from staff that they're scurrying around trying to figure out how to do that. One question in particular, it seemed unusual that the AP went from recognizing the Chinese New Year to then with the next statement you had there was just end the tags December 31st. Well, that would completely uh, be a problem for us as we fold into January with our fishery. We're into January up to the 21st and certainly uh, we do have some, we're trying to identify them. We know of at least one harvester, maybe two, that hold fish and hold exactly for that situation. So I know this has been lingering for several years, um, but I, I think it's a, uh, it's a lot, quite frankly. So I, I appreciate any feedback specifically on the best management practices versus having something where we're in compliance, and I think what Jay brought up is worth more discussion. I want to get Joe next, but I, I think the key questions today are the program start date, the tag accounting date, and the tag expiration date. Everything else about how you deal with your harvesters and distribute tags, I think is something each state can, can sort of bake internally within their state rulemaking. But um, it's going to be critical that to make this program work, to have it be mandatory that there aren't uh, fish and in interstate commerce that don't have tags. And so we're, I think all, all of us states are going to have to prohibit the possession of untagged to tag at, at, at some date certain, and that we, we need to decide that today. So go ahead, Joe Zamino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm assuming we're into comments and not questions. So. Um, I, I think, you know, we had long discussions about where the tag should be or when the tag should be, and so you didn't suggest that this is one of it, but the AP talked about at the dealer, and we, we, we felt that would not address the issue, so I, I, I think that can be taken off the table. Um, I would suggest, because I don't think that anyone's, these tags are quite cheap, so I don't think that anyone's fishery is so large that as a state we shouldn't be over-ordering and they can hold on to those excess tags and, and redistribute if they feel there's a need after that initial uh, distribution. Um, I, I do agree with the AP that it's important for those tagged fish to not have an expired tag so that a dealer could hold on to fish or even the, the, the harvester can hold on to the fish. I think the expiration is for those unused tags. You know, if states could put it in that, that if a, a vessel was stopped in 2021 with unused 2020 tags, then, then there's a problem. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we can move forward on. But one other thing that I thought was well hashed out was this, this has to be an all or nothing. I, I, I sympathize with Maryland, but I, I, I don't see how one state could not do this when the others have to, as you said. Every fish that's out there for commerce should have a tag, and that would also apply to different starting dates. I mean, if if, we, if states can't start till July one, then then this program should start on July one. And I'll leave it at that. So, Joe, to the point you're making on page five, uh, there's a section called tag expiration, and what's implied there is that fish that are being held by dealers would have to be liquidated by some date certain 
in the new year. And so we're looking for that cutoff date. So we're looking for you to, or the group, the board, to endorse some date. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and, and, and we had some conversations with our, our law enforcement guys on this, and, and they said if, if the whole point is for any fish in commerce to have a tag, and all those fish have a tag, how important is it whether or not that there's a, 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 a date tied to that? So I'm not sure there needs to be an expiration date. That's personal thing. All right, Maureen, did you have another comment? Go ahead, Tony. Joe, in order for that to work, do you think then, though, the fishermen will also have to report tags used in order for us to link what was used and what was returned? Right now, we don't, that's not a requirement. Because otherwise, I decide to only return 10 of the 20 tags I have and I sell the rest to some recreational fishermen and those tags get into the market, but there's no way to prove that they weren't caught by a commercial fisherman because right now we don't have any requirements to say that the tag was used by this fisherman on this date. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, so I, I fully support the, the, the guidelines that each harvester is assigned a, a, a range of tags, and these are lessons learned from striped bass, I mean, because this is all there for striped bass as well. If, if, if a harvester has a, a range of tags and, and that is known, those sold tags, um, well, going back, if, if that harvester comes in asking for more tags, then yes, there should be some sort of process to say, I, I either used all those tags or, or they were unused. And for some states, they use affidavits if they're saying, you know, that they lost a certain amount, uh, an exceptional amount of tags. All right, any other discussion? Yeah, David Borden. I, I'd like to go back to a point that Kirby made. Um, fine, he used the term final sale. They have to keep the tag on. And, uh, and I was trying to find it in the document. Is it defined in the document, in the guideline, what constitutes final sale? I couldn't find it, but that is probably Yep. So for the guidelines, it's in the guidelines. This is specific to tag expiration. It'd be to tag with expired tags may be sold only directly to the final consumer. Page five. Okay. Thank you. Joe, are you comfortable with that? So there wouldn't be an expiration date. So a dealer could possess expired tagged fish, but they could only be sold to a consumer. Is that what you're thinking? Mike? Just as a, as a comment to that, before we went to the new system for striped bass, we had, we had no date on the tags. They, were, they just rolled from year to year, and it created the situations that we got ourselves into with the harvesters losing boxes. There was, they didn't have to return anything. So there was no need to return it because it never expired. And it, and it just snowballed on itself over the years where all of these unaccounted for tags, you give, them, you give somebody a thousand tags and never expect them to return them. They're, you know, they can go anywhere out there because you, there's, no, there's no audit. And, and that's, I think, an important part of that expiration data on the tag so that they have to be returned and then there's an audit by the state. Uh, Kirby, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just again to remind the board that the language in the amendment right right now is that all states will require recipients to return unused tags from the previous fishing year no later than February 15th. Go ahead, Mike. One of the comments that we made had to do with does it have to be a calendar year, or can can the, can you have a fishing year, and then have your tags returned during your closed season, 45 days, which would be the same as January 1 to February 15 after the end of your fishing year? 
And that, that could be helpful for my staff that are doing all the auditing and to the five fishermen that we have, and it just could be helpful. I don't know if other states would be in the same you know, situation. So the language is specific to the previous fishing year. It doesn't have it tied currently to a calendar year. And I think part of that is because you do have some states that have a fishing season that extends across two calendar years. Any other qu questions or comments? Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Kirby's comment, and I'm reading the, the requirement that if you have, if you are a dealer and you have expired tags, you have to sell them. <clears throat> if you're a dealer and you have a to tag with a, an expired tag, you are required to sell it to the final consumer. But that that's totally insane. It's totally insane. It's, I mean, I. We don't sell to the final consumer. We sell to a wholesaler who may sell to another wholesaler who sells to, you know, a little mom and pop store, and somebody's going to walk in and buy one fillet, maybe a half a fillet. I mean, that that requirement is is, is that's not reality, and it's not acceptable for the market. No way. So I want to. I'm going to keep coming back to this, guys. We've got the draft implementation guidelines so they are not requirements right now so that to talk will expi with expired tags may be sold only directly to a final consumer is in the draft implementation guidelines so as i mentioned before if you want to change or adjust the language in there we're happy to take that those comments today to, to make those changes if you want to make it a requirement that's also something the board can do but i need i need the board to clarify what, what the pre pleasure of the group is Eric, did you want to follow up? Well, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, this whole thing is, is really, I've lost a lot of sleep over this because of just this whole thing is kind of crazy. So, the issue of an expired tag or the date of expiration, um, I mean, have you ever try to tag, it's a tag with two tags? You got a harvester's tag and a dealer's tag. I mean, I, I just, I don't know how. Well, there's not going to be a dealer tag in this program. Well, I, uh, for my, my opinion from the very beginning has been that the dealer should have the tags because of your, you know, you're talking about point of last sale versus point of first sale. Um, you know, I'm not even sure if a guy with it's got a t tag to tag has to sell to a licensed dealer. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Does a, does a harvester who has a, Tag to tag, have to sell it to a licensed dealer. I think that's, I'm, a, I'm that's a question I'm, that every state yeah. would have to answer around the table. Well, Certainly in my state, it does. Okay. All right. Well, I, I just. Uh, Are you thinking of like over the rail sales of uh, like retail boat sort of stuff, where you direct sales to the public? I, I, honestly, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to think of the accounting of the tags themselves. And how you how you can keep the accounting for all those tags? You're gonna you know you're gonna lose 10 percent right off the top apparently. Um, that that's that's an interesting number. I'm sure it's more than that. But I, I just this whole thing about you know we're gonna tag them and we're, we're gonna have some accounting of all this. I mean I know in Rhode Island for striped bass, in order for me to get my next year's tags, I have to take all my unused tags and turn them in every one. And when I get tags, I have to sign for numbers, you know, 1,000 through 1,100 or whatever. And I have to sign for it and prove that I'm a dealer. So I, I just, um... Well, let me ask you this. As a Rhode Island dealer, do you only buy fish caught in Rhode Island? Yes. Okay. And Jay, when do you land fish? And when do you land to tog in your state? What months? What months of the year do you have commercial sales to tog? Yeah, I mean, it, so it's off and on, but starting in April and, and ending in December, usually. Okay, so, so Eric, how many months into the following year do you need to hold on to those fish? Well, we, don't, we only participate in the fresh market. We don't do live market, but, you know, the Chinese New Year is a lunar based on the moon, not on the day. So it would change every year what, what that market condition 
when that's going to appear. So, you know, if you want to get into the, forget about the calendar year or the fishing year, you want to get into the lunar year, now we're really going into the, the weeds there. But that's the market. That, that's what that's based on. Well, so, is, is three months sufficient? No, I think the end of February would be fine. But like okay. I said, we only, we only participate in the fresh market. We don't participate yeah. in the live market. Well, could we make the tag expiration then uh, through the end of February of the following year? Is that a reasonable accommodation? I think it would be reasonable. I don't okay. know if Chinese New Year has ever gone into March. I don't think that that right. would be correct. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead, Doug. Would it help? I don't know. Striped bass fishery, we, we do it at point of landing is our expiration, not at point of sale. Point of sale can, can, be, uh, can continue, uh, and the expiration is solely set on, on that date, that end of the, end of the calendar year. Uh, at point of landing, though, at point of landing, is, as long as that fish is landed within that season, uh, can be sold, you know, outside of that perimeter. But uh, it seems to work for us uh, at the at the point of landing, uh, without without issue. So I just want to, uh, you know, clarify for the board again. There is not language that requires a tag expiration date in the FMP right now. If you want to add that, we can. But what we have put up on the screen for you all to, to consider regarding that topic is the closed and open seasons commercially for each of the states. So on the screen you have in red is when a state is closed. And in green is when a state's commercial season is open. And if you have a transition, that's usually showing that the, st the start date is not falling on the first day or the end of the, the month. And Tony has a point. So originally when we had talked about this, we said we would put the year and that we thought all the tags would expire December 31st, just like any other fishery. So as we continue to discuss this and recognize that there are these states that have fisheries that span over December and January. What if on the tag, instead of putting the year, like 2019, we put the month and year that that fishing year ends so that you could sell up until the end of that month and then you turn your tags in 45 days after the end of that month? Will that work for the states? Which is Following the premise of the addendum, you, we had said February 15th before because it's 45 days after the end of December 31st. It will mean that there are tags with different time frames, which I don't know what law enforcement would say about that, but I'm just trying to figure out a way to make these tags work so that fishermen don't have to get tags in the middle of their fishing year, which I recognize is unrealistic. I think that might be challenging, Tony, for a state that has a quota because the quota could fill in October. And I, in other words, we, we might have a season that's only two months of, or six months, depending on the quota filling. For those states that their fishing year spans, do you, because uh, your quota starts on January 1 then? Do you, would you open your, like, for example, Mike, if you had a, well, you don't have a quota. Maryland, do you have a quota? Or uh, Delaware, do you have a quota? No, they're attacking. New Jersey, do you have a quota? You have kept, because I, I'm, because if you, if you had a quota when your, and your fishery closed in October, would you reopen January 1? Or would you keep it closed until the, what looks like the opening sometime in September. Well, no, I mean, I, I, quite frankly, I think that I don't think that we would need to do this seasonally. I think annual works for us. And, and you know, going back to my original statements, I think there would be value in the tags, unused tags, expiring annually. You know, used tags, or a, a tag in a fish, not necessarily needing that, that same expiration. And I think that's kind of what the AP was getting at. Um, and I also wonder if we could, if we thought this through, if states could handle receiving an order all at the same time, all the states receive the order at the same time, and then the states figure out when distribution would be most appropriate. 
I'm just trying to determine if you're fishing your spans more than one calendar year, what date do we put on that tag? That's the part that I am struggling with for you all. Go ahead, Marmeen. Uh, when we discussed, uh, thank you, thanks, Dan. When we discussed uh, getting tags for our tow tog, and our season spans from April through the following January, if we say got tags for 2020, they we would keep them in effect through January of 2021, and law enforcement would know that those tags go until the end of the fishing season, which ends in January. Um, but for most of 2020, they would, they would be fine. Um, we also said because the dealers are going to keep the fish, you know, well past the end of the season, especially if they're trying to sell fish for the January uh, the Chinese New Year. Uh, we said that market tagged fish will allow that to expire uh, March 15th. So that, and we tell we'll tell this to our law enforcement that um, 2020 tags for fishing will be good un for fish until. January 25th, the season ends. However, dealers will hold fish t labeled 2020 until March 15th. Um, and in light of that, <laughs> here's my question for Tony. Will we have enough space on the tags to put all the numbers that we are required to by the guidelines? And I know that they're just the guidelines right now, but in terms of what you're going to do for 2020, how we were concerned because of the number of tags we might have to order for New York because we do not have a quota and our we're just limited to 25 fish a day. And so off the top of my head, if we order 100,000 tags, does that give you enough space to put everything you need on the tag? Caitlin is going to speak to that. She worked on this question. Well, I, I can... Oh, Kirby, sorry. The simple answer is yes. <laughs> um, but... Um, if you want some more details, Caitlin can speak to what has been thought through for the numbers that would go on to tag. I mean, in my mind, many of these fisheries are very small scale. Um, there's overfishing occurring, and many of these stocks are overfished. It may be necessary to tweak the, the in-state rules to accommodate this tagging program. I don't think we need we should be throwing the tagging program out because we have some rather loose rules within one jurisdiction or another. It may be that we need to evolve the rules to accommodate the tag. But go ahead. We intended we intended to enact the tagging program, but since we, we currently don't have a quota, we weren't going to use a tagging program to establish the quota. Um, so we wanted to make sure we would be able to order enough tags to accommodate our fishermen and then make sure that I know that there's a limited space on the tags. No, I agree. So if I said that I needed um, one, two, three, six Six digits. digits. Yeah. Just to make sure each one has a unique number, would the tags be able to accommodate that? Because I believe New York has one of the largest landings of tow tags on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And so we're not ready yet to, to start no. limiting our fishery just like that. Yeah, but what I meant to say is uh, because you have a closure beginning in February, you have a natural break that will allow you to do the accounting. And I'm suggesting that that's probably something that ju other jurisdictions should probably consider to accommodate the administration of this program. So, all right. Rob O'Reilly. So I want to come back to the expiration date. I know we've, we've moved a little away from that. But uh, so despite the graphic up there, I see three states New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia on table eight that roll through the calendar year and have a fishery in January. So I guess what I'm wondering is can we settle on an expiration date for the previous year? Um, because come January, that year's tag is going to be made available. The previous year tag is going to be um, still there, I hope, by those who are holding fish for the Chinese New Year. And, you know, how difficult is it going to be to do that? One thing that we thought about is a permitting system. So you're going to have a declaration. If you're going to hold fish uh, beyond the calendar year, you're going to have a permit to do so. I mean, that's one thing that we have talked about. So um, there probably are ways at the state level 
to uh, take care of a end of February expiration date on the previous calendar year's tag. And I'm just wondering, is that something that is beneficial to the board? Because I know that Eric made a pretty good point about where he thinks the tag should be, but it seems as if it's going to be on the harvester from everything I know. And because of that, uh, I'm just curious as to can we set an expiration date knowing that we leave it up to the state to ensure that those tags that are held beyond the calendar year are held by those individuals that the state knows have permission to do so and law enforcement in that state knows that those are the individuals, not going to be a lot, uh, have the ability to hold those fish and tags at that time. Um, Mike, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so um, to Maureen's example, so if the state of Maryland had a tag with a printed date on there, 2020, but we had our internally established an expiration date for that 2020 tag as being May 15th, 2021, that we established that via whatever rulemaking process we have. We have our own expiration date for that tag. It, it simplifies for me just having a date on the tag and then we just decide what our own expiration date is for it. So that would work. Yeah, uh, sorry, we were sidebarring trying to think through this and, and give you guys the best guidance and, th and trying to de determine if an expiration date is really necessary and really come back to the guidance uh, implementation guidance document and the language right now says the tags will expire when the fishing year when they were issued ends so as you can see on the screen there are two states that have a, a fishing year that straddles two calendar years right New York and Virginia so really if if that calendar year does not work for your state then it would be up to your state to kind of think through what is the best guidelines for that. I think Maureen outlined generally how they are going to view this in the state of New York for tags that are issued in the previous fishing year, but it, their fishing season ends in the, in the next calendar year. Um, and again, if, if this is a requirement that you guys want to put in place, then you can do that. But otherwise, if you are looking to just change the language in these draft guidelines, this is what we're hoping to get feedback on you from you all today. Kirby, it sounds like consistent with Eric Reed's comments, we he would want us to strike the last sentence of tag expiration which says to tog with expired tags may be sold only directly to the final consumer. You Eric would want that struck. Otherwise uh, the rest of the section could remain intact and that would satisfy Maureen's concerns which is to allow each state to have a fishing year that may cross over New Year's Day. All right. So everybody okay if we strike that last line and we, we take it up in that fashion, allowing states to define their own fishing year? Yes, Maureen, you good? Okay. All right, anything else? Yes, go ahead, Maureen. Uh, I also understand in the guidelines it says that uh, we should be assigning tags by management area. Uh, do I have that correct, Kirby? I don't believe so. Can you refer to where that is in the document? I don't have the document open. I have my notes open, <laughs> not, not the document. Um, because we would be able to explain where the, t where the fish were caught by stat area from the VTRs as opposed to assigning the tags by management area. Um. I don't recall seeing a, a, any reference in the document to tags or, or um, attributed to a management area. Yeah, uh, just to confirm that I'm not seeing that as well. It's not a requirement in the amendment and I don't see it in the implementation guidelines. Any other comments on the document? Yes, Justin. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what would now be the last sentence in the tag expiration section of the guidelines says it will be illegal for any dealer to buy or sell any Tautog with an expired tag. So if I'm following this correctly, the expiration date for the tag would vary by state and would be at some point in time past the end of the fishing season at which, you know, it's reasonable to expect the dealer has had ample opportunity to sell sort of standing stock by that point. So this isn't conflicting with that sort of need to hold on to fish past the expiration date and, or past the end of the fishing season and sell them. I'm going to let Caitlin answer that. I just missed it. Sorry. I think if you're suggesting removing that language, that would work. Um, so maybe an addition would be it will be illegal for any dealer to buy or sell any to tog or sorry to buy any to tog see so going through this document with you now staff's recommendation may be to remove those last two sentences such that for the guidelines, it would read, tags will expire when the fishing year for which they were issued ends. In parentheses, unless the state determines this would be unnecessarily restrict harvest and sale at the end of the year, in which case an alternate expiration date could be determined. That would be the end of it for that section. Everybody go with that? Good. All right. Thank you, Justin. Good pickup. All right. I think we're pretty close. Any other comments? Yes, Ray Kane. So we're talking about two states, so I'm going to presume uh, Virginia and New York will make their submission 45 days after the middle of January or the 20th or 21st of January, Rob? That's when the season ends, yes, yeah. for that portion. Yeah, so you'll be submitting your numbers back within 45 days after January 21st, as the other states are required. I was just going to say that's the requirement. So, um, you know, we haven't, of course, gotten to that point. Um, I have a little confusion here on New York and Virginia being the only states. Is Table 8 incorrect in the documents? because it certainly looks like Delaware and New Jersey roll through December into January. That's what Table 8 says. And Table 8 says New York does not, but Virginia does. And that's why I indicated earlier that three states roll through a calendar year into the next year. So, um, I mean, that's been a little bit of confusion for me. Rob, Tony, I think, wanted to comment I think that maybe we misspoke earlier. There are, I think, five states that have the potential to carry over through the calendar year that have fisheries that go past January or December 31st. So in the plan, the one requirement that still holds is that states need to turn in their unused tags by February 5th. Harvesters must, sorry, uh, turn in their tags by February 15th. I, uh, I think that a state could apply for conservation equivalency uh, when your fishing year spans two calendar years and request that your state turn in your or your harvesters turn in their tags to the state 45 days after the end of your fishing year um, and or in order to get their new tags whatever i don't know if all of these fishing years have 45 days in between them but i would suggest they not be able to have their two years worth of tags in their hands at the same time. I think you would want to make sure you have the previous year's tags before they can have the new year's tags as we do in striped bass. Rob O'Reilly. So consistent with what Ray <laughs> asked me, the answer is yes, but at the same time, um, given everything that's been done to get to this point, 
I still see that the state's going to be responsible, I'm just informing you, for sort of having a two-tier system. So in other words, if you're a harvester and you are not holding fish for the live market, then those tags will come in before, um, you know, and the other tags will be there on the fish. So as long as that's something that we're all in agreement about, because I don't expect a lot of harvesters in Virginia, but I know there'll at least be a couple, um, maybe three, and so I hope that that is certainly consistent with what the board's talking about. And in Tony's case, that would mean that no one would have two years of tags um, except those individuals, those few individuals who would be holding fish for the Chinese New Year. Is that still consistent? Go ahead, Tony. Well, the, the fishermen would, if, you're, if you have a fish in your tank, you've already tagged it, so you're not holding on to your tags from the previous year. You're, you've tagged that fish and if you're into your next fishing year, you wouldn't need the previous year's tags anymore because, yes, you could have tags in a tank that have two different calendar year tags, but you as an individual harvester couldn't have tags in your hands with two different calendar year tags. Rob? No, no I wasn't suggesting that, and I think, uh, I think we've moved to a situation where it's a lot more understandable through this discussion, uh, I think it'll work out. And so I appreciate that, Tony. All right, um, are we good? Yes, Ray. So I have a question looking at this graph. We, we want to get this mandated and in place by January of 2020, right? So, and we seem to be hung up on the fact that some states roll into January 21st. So, follow-up years, as Jason had mentioned, we're going to have to tweak this as we go along, but follow-up years, I, there seems to be a concerted effort to get this up and running by January 1 of 2020. And states will need that liberty to report up until January 21st, or now we're looking at Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. But years following, like in 21, the year should start January 1, and it ends December 31st. So, Kirby, I'm sorry. Ben. No, it, it's all right, Ray. I, you know, I'm realizing that there there could have been some more clarity to this graph, but. You know, I'm looking at the FMP right now that we reviewed state compliance reports, and with the exception of New York, all other states are listing that if they are starting, if they have a fishery in January, it's starting January 1. It is not straddling two different fishing years. All right. Um, any other comments? So, do, what about the implementation date? Um, can can states succeed in getting rules enacted uh, by January one to require tagging um, for harvesters and to prohibit untagged fish in dealers? What do you say, Mike? It was part of our comment, and Maryland can't get it done in time because we have to go through a process to identify a, a group of you, people who are going to be applying for these tags, and that's the process we do. We have a declaration period, which we have to establish via regulation. And then uh, we, we can't get it done by January 1st, but we can begin the process of working to have it accomplished as soon as we can in the, in the new year. But after this discussion today, I'm thinking about prohibiting all commercial landings of TOG in Maryland and just... I'll back. I'll walk away now. <laughs> Maureen. So our season for Toe Talk will not open until April, tw what, I forgot, April 25th. I forgot mm -hmm. the date already. So we would not put it in effect January 1 because we're going to consider that to be still the 2019 season. Okay. 
So uh, we will probably have our regulations in effect in time when our season opens in April. April 1. April 20 something or other, yeah. Okay. Is and that okay? Or is this, I'm just Well, let's find out what the consensus view is among the states and maybe we can just delay uh, to some common date. Okay. Uh, Jay. I was just gonna offer, I mean, so what both Mike and Maureen have offered seem like perfectly fine uh, exemptions. I'd rather, you know, we were supposed to have this in place right now, so I'd rather get it going, allow some flexibility in this first year, but just mandate that it needs to start January 1. If you have it in process, that's good. If your fishery doesn't start until April, that's good. Like, we're not going to find people out of compliance, but let's get it, get okay. it going. All right. Anyone else? Go ahead, Marmee. Well, to be clear, uh, Totog harvested in New York in January will not be tagged because we're not going to start it until April. David Borden. In the spirit of trying to help, Mr. Chairman, how about if we just say if January 1 is the date or as soon after as the state can implement the regulation, and they'll notify the commission of that date. That's all. I'll take that. <laughs> All right. So it's it won't be a strict compliance criteria uh, for January 1, but it'll be to maybe commence rulemaking by January 1, Tony? Okay, we can we can monitor rulemaking and if and if each state could send the plan coordinator um, their uh, public hearing notice or whatever's being proposed so we can keep um, keep our eyes on that. But I, I know in Massachusetts we intend to have it in place by January 1. Eric, go ahead. Okay, so what about, like, let's say I want to buy to talk from New York in January and they're not tagged, but we're, we are engaged in our tagging program. How are you going inter to interact with interstate commerce of non-tagged fish in states that are complying with the tag? tagging program earlier than a, another state. Maybe. I think that's an issue for Jay when he goes to rulemaking. If he enacts the tagging program on January 1, you as a dealer in the state of Rhode Island can make that comment that you'd like to get three months of grace period until uh, after that time period. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> okay. Yes, Tony and Bob. Not to complicate anything, but it might be worthwhile to have the states that can't implement by January 1st identify, you know, what they anticipate their timeline to be, and then come back at the annual meeting to have those conversations. And, and then Jay will know if he needs to give three Garrett three months grace period or six months if you, you know if they're buying fish from Maryland. If Mike's going to take even longer, something along, you know, just so there's a, a sort of a conscious decision about. What are the timelines for each of the states? A number of states can and will be able to go on January 1st, but there's a couple that have identified they haven't. It's probably worthwhile to have that conversation and identify those timelines for those states. Does that mean we'll schedule a board meeting for the October, or or just make it I'm, we policy can. board? It's probably, you know, it, it, maybe you know if we set a date, notify the commission by October 15th of your timeline, and then we'll see what those look like and see if we need a board meeting. So, I don't know, pick a date. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe maybe September 15th so we can do the agenda, but um, <laughs> I don't know, until the last minute. Um, but, you know, something that I, I, I think if, if once the states go home and really start thinking about this, if there's even more, which would be hard to believe, even more difficulties than we've already talked about, um, you know, I think we need to maybe set aside some time to work through those. Okay. So uh, does the board agree that a September 15th deadline to report back to, to the commission on their rulemaking uh, timeline. All right, thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, the rest of the agenda then, All right? Next is the, um, the ex plan review report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to go through this quickly given we are um, 
behind on our schedule. Um, I'm going to go first through the management measures. All the states implemented new regulations consistent with Amendment 1. Um, Long Island Sound and the New Jersey, New York Bight region put in place regulations to reduce harvest for that Long Island Sound region. It was to achieve a 20.3% reduction for the New Jersey, New York uh, Bight. It was commercial and recreational measures to achieve a 2% reduction. The Massachusetts through Rhode Island region, Maury, and Delmarva, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia implemented regional regulations. Uh, uh, this is an important slide for you all. Since the last assessment, as you're aware, NOAA implemented changes to the MRIP program for estimating recreational catch. Um, so that multi-year transition uh, changed much of the harvest estimates for the entire time series. In particular, if you're looking at the graph on the screen, we have what the base series calculations are. That's what we were using up until last year. We have the calibration applied uh, to the APIS design since 2013, and then we have the final calibrated estimates that are the higher ones. So what this shows you is that annual coastwide harvest by weight has increased at the coastwide level in all years anywhere between 27 percent to 323 percent after this calibration uh, took place. This is the recreational data. So then looking at commercial and recreational harvest together, we're looking at landings from 90 or 81 to 2016. Commercial landings decreased by 15 percent in 2018 from 2017. In 2018, the commercial landings value was its highest ever at $3.98 dollars uh, per pound. Recreational harvest, though, while it was much higher for the time series, decreased in 2017 rel in 2018 relative to 2017. Um, these recreational landings in 2018 were the lowest in the time series. And as you're aware, recreational harvest is consistently made up at least 90% of coastwide landings combined. For the biological sampling program, New York, Delaware, and Virginia were unable to meet the 200 age sample requirement. Uh, the states reported that they did try to acquire these samples, and each state had different reasons for why it was difficult. New York has uh, had issues with the contract that they previously worked with. For Virginia, they had a donation freezer um, that was at a marina that has since been removed and Delaware has had more difficulty trying to get some of their samples uh, from a previous four hire um, captain that they've worked with. Uh, in spite of that, the PRT recommends that the board find all states in compliance with the sampling requirements as these states did strive to try to collect these samples. Uh, one note to the FMP review, uh, Maryland's regulations uh, are, will be updated to reflect that they have a start date of January 1. Um, and the plan review team recommends that states should make more clear what their state measures are in their compliance reports and what those measures uh, result in for their regional management program to achieve a regional F target. This was spelled out in the amendment. In terms of de minimis requests, Delaware and Maryland have both uh, requested de minimis status and continue to qualify for the commercial sector, and the plan review team recommends that the board approve the states for their request. So for board consideration today, move to accept the uh, 2019 to TOG FMP review and state compliance reports and approve de minimis requests for Delaware and Maryland. Can I get someone to make that motion? Oh, yes, uh, Ray. Second, David Borden. Let's get it up on the screen first. Shall I read it to the record? It wasn't. Shall I read it? Uh, I'll read it into the record. Motion to accept the 2019 Tatag FMP review and state compliance reports and approve de minimis status for Delaware and Maryland. Motion by Mr. Kane, seconded by Mr. Borden. Any objections to the motion? Seeing none, it's unanimously uh, consented. All right, uh, the next item on our agenda is the election of a vice chairman. Jay McNamee, before we get there. Yep. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I didn't want to interfere with the motion, but did want to make a comment on the, the age samples. Um, in particular, now that we've moved to a, you know, a set of spatial region-specific stock assessments, I just want, I wanted to make the statement that it, the age information, the age samples become more important. And so I just wanted to offer um, I know folks are trying. I know the PRT was, um, you know, felt that people had made efforts, but I just want to reemphasize the importance of getting age samples from your regions because we are using age structured models that are now spatially explicit. So it has added importance now. Thank you. All right. Um, we're looking for a vice chairman and we're looking for a motion. Yes, Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I nominate Bill Hyatt to be the next vice chair of the Tautog Management Board. Would you like to close nominations as well? I would. Uh, any objection to Bill Hyatt being the next Tautog Board Chair? Second. Oh, second. Thank you. Can I get a second? Jay McNamee. Any objections to Bill Hyatt as the next Board Chair? Vice Chair. Oh, it'll be quick. It'll be Board Chair. <laughs> All right, uh, seeing none, thank you, Bill, for enlisting as vice chair. And next meeting will be my last, so maybe you'll be up then. Um, so that's the uh, end of the meeting, end of our agenda. Bob, do you have any announcements? Oh, Emerson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to correct something that Kirby mentioned when he was going through the review on, on samplings, where he said that in New York, there was a problem with the contractor. There was not a problem with the contractor. There was a, there is a problem with the state issuing a new contract to the contractor. So I just want to make that clarification. Thank you. Bob, any announcements? Uh, I'm done. <laughs> uh, this meeting, uh, any objection to a Adjourning, seeing none, meetings adjourned. Bob?